Well, I'm Nancy Bolt. I'm the co-chair of the program committee for um, Jefferson Humanists. And we want to welcome you to our monthly meeting. Um, typically, we would be at the Jefferson Unitarian Church meeting in person and smiling at each other, maybe giving some hugs. But we're not doing that today. Uh, we're all in our living rooms and or someplace else and, and, and connecting online uh, so that we can follow the, the um, the rules from Colorado and uh, in the government to stay, to distance ourselves from each other. Um, so that's why we're bringing this to you online. And you will have noticed if you're a member of Jefferson Humanists that there's been a lot of online meetings from Jefferson Humanists. Most of our groups have been going online with the exception of hiking, which is a little hard to do online, but um, everything else we've had online. And so we're trying to keep you connected to each other and to humanist thoughts and programs um, during this time of, of stay at home. Um, as I said, we're muting all of you and uh, or we want you to mute yourself and to turn off your video so that we can, um, um, so that we can focus on the speakers when they come on. Uh, we're not having a humanist moment at, at this meeting because we're trying to cut it a little short, uh, shorter than usual because uh, we know people get um, get a little tired of um, of being online for too long. It, it can be a little exhausting to just sit there and, and um, stare at a screen. So here we do have some, um, some announcements for you that we want to share. Um, we're happy you can join us, of course. Um, the board has voted to continue this physical distancing policy until June 11th or until the governor raises restrictions on group events. And even then, um, we think people will wanna wear their masks for a while. Uh, you can see our meetup page um, if you are looking for our programs. Um, uh, Carol Wilson, our, um, our energetic uh, newsletter editor has been gone from monthly to weekly newsletters so that we can get, get announcements to you quicker of things that are coming up and, and provide hopefully some interesting articles about what people are doing during this, um, this distancing. Uh, some of the programs that are coming up, we have a movie discussion. It's called Hunt for the Wild People. Um, now we ask you to watch it on your own. We don't watch it together. Um, it's available streaming from Jeffco Library and it might be from some other uh, places as well. You can check whatever you have subscriptions to. Um, it's called Hunt for the Wilder People, and the discussion of it's going to be this Tuesday, April 28th at 7 p.m. So if you want to, um, to join that, watch the movie, watch um, for the, the link on Meetup, uh, and, um, and, and join us on Tuesday. The virtual happy hour will have a trivia contest this time. It's going to be on Wednesday at 7 p.m. So again, watch Meetup for the link, or uh, you can email Tom Kellogg and he will send you the link. The JH Salon, now if you remember, this is a new program we were just starting when this all hit, and it's an opportunity to have more in-depth questions about perplexing issues that our country um, is facing. And this time it's going to be um, discussing the question, as universal health care a basic human right? And that's going to be Monday, May 4th. Got a week to get ready for that. It's again at 7 p.m. This is hosted by, um, by Matthew, um, Elijah, and Tracy Bickle. And you can either uh, get the uh, join over meetup and we'll send you a link, or you can email Tracy or, or Matthew and they will send it to you. And then um, finally, Frog. Our, um, our book group is going to be discussing On Tyranny on Saturday, May 9th. If you've not read, read this short book, you can read it in about an hour. Um, it is really scary to read because it's happening now. And so um, we're going to determine the time. I think the time is going to be at 2 p.m. Um, for you. And again, watch me up for the details. That's On Tyranny. <clears throat> And then one final thought, you know that uh, one of our major social action projects has to do with Action Center, where we have been donating things to them and also uh, going once a month, or not once a month, but uh, on a regular basis 
to help them pack groceries. Well, they're closed down. They're not. They're closed down for that public activity, and um, and you can still give them. Um, uh, they're still providing service through drive up, walk up appointments, uh, so people can get much needed food and toiletries um, if you're low income. Uh, donations of non perishable food, toiletries, and washed reusable bags are needed, and volunteers are appreciated. So you should check their website to see how you would go about volunteering on an individual basis and what their donation hours are. So I think that is the end of the, um, of the announcements. Okay, so um, you may remember that our program today was supposed to be, in addition to being in person, it was supposed to be out about marijuana and the laws that govern it by an attorney. Well, she is very busy dealing with COVID virus. And so we were very, very lucky to be able to get two speakers from the, um, from the, the National Association. So we are very uh, happy to have Kristen Wintermute and Emily Newman from um, American Humanist Association. Now, Kristen is the Director of Education. She's got a BA in psychology and a minor in art studio from the University of Montana and a master's degree in social work from the University of Maine. She worked for seven years as a family therapist in a variety of settings, including private practice, a nonprofit clinic for women, and, and a for-profit health maintenance organization. In 1998, she was hired by the North American Committee for Humanism, called NACH, as a membership director. In 1999, NACH and its subsidiary of the Humanist Institute became one organization, and she became its business manager and later its executive director. And then in 2018, the Humanist Institute became the American Humanist Association Center for Education. So she's been involved in this for a very long time. She's a lifelong humanist who attended the First Unitarian Society of Minneapolis throughout her childhood and teen years and continues to work with them on events and programs. And then finally, uh, the next speaker is um, Emily Newman, also with AHA, she's the education coordinator. She holds a BS in psychology and creative writing, as well as an MA in professional writing from Carnegie Mellon University. She's also communications coordinator of the American Ethical Union. Emily grew at the Brooklyn Society for Ethical Culture and has been active with the Future of Ethical Societies, National Ethical Service, and Young Humanists International. Over the years, she has assisted local nonprofits and small businesses with social media design, social website development, and marketing. So I'm glad to turn this over to Kristen and Emily, and they're going to take it from here. Hi, everyone. I'm Kristen. I'm the Director of Education. I didn't expect you to read my whole bio. <laughs> <laughs> So I did. <laughs> I have no introduction prepared, but okay. So we'll just jump right into it. Um, the American Humanist Association proudly serves as the leading progressive voice in America on behalf of humanists, atheists, agnostics, and free thinkers. Can you go to the next slide? Um, our mission at the AHA is to advance humanism, an ethical and life-affirming philosophy free of belief in any gods and other supernatural forces, advocating for equality, for non-theistic, and a society guided by reason, empathy, and our growing knowledge of the world. The AHA promotes a worldview that encourages individuals to live informed and meaningful lives that aspire to the greater good. We do this in a variety of ways, as the next slide will show you. So this is a graphic that shows the breakdown of the American Humanist Association's work. Um, and the, we're going to mention the publications later. For example, as you um, who are members have seen, we have the Humanist Magazine, Free Mind, our uh, website itself, and various other options. Uh, we are part of a variety of coalitions that help us extend our work. For example, Humanist International and the Secular Coalition for America are ones you've probably heard of. Uh, there are various adjunct organizations like the Humanist Society, uh, the Humanist Foundation uh, that, that continue to 
uh, expand on the work that we do. And then we're going to focus today a little bit on the programs because that's kind of the um, essential parts um, or departments of the organization. Uh, during the COVID-19, um, the Legislative and Social Justice Department of the EHA has committed to ensuring the current crisis isn't exploited for political power grabs. As this ep epidemic is certainly presenting serious threats to people's rights, safety, and democracy, as we all listen in the news. Um, the couple of things they've been focusing on during COVID is humanists from 47 states sent um, 1,543 messages to Congress to ensure that Secretary Betsy DeVoe was given unprecedented waiver authority to weaken student rights to public education in the last COVID response bill. The Legislative Department is also working hard to make sure the pandemic isn't an opportunity to just shut down access to reproductive health care and they're continuing their ongoing advocacy for humanists and working within the Senate to advance resolutions opposing the blasphemy laws, as well as ensuring that the US both, um, holds India accountable for religious discrimination. In 2020, the legislative, just some you know, quick points about some of the things that they've accomplished. Um, it's overseen by coordinator Rachel Deitch, um, some of the things that they've accomplished this year is they were asked to testify at a congressional hearing on global religious persecution in the House in January 28th. This was the first time a secular organization has testified at a hearing in at least the last 40 years, and it was the first time the AHA was ever invited to testify. Well, it was a big accomplish. The department also launched a new humanist action headquarters that enables supporters to take action on humanist issues by calling or writing your elected officials and submitting comments on proposed regulatory changes. In February, more than 10,000 messages were sent to senators, representatives, state legislators, and U.S. departments regarding new regulations that further enable relig religious discrimination calls to Kansas to keep abortion restrictions out of the state's constitution, put Patients First Act, and to support Congressional Darwin Day resolution. Last, in March, during appropriate, this is during appropriation season, they worked in partnership with the Secular Coalition of America, FFRF, CFI, and Smart Recovery, asking Congress to include language in the APROS bill that affirms support for self-empowering mutual support groups, accepting of medication assisted treatment and allocates funding accordingly, and worked with the Foundation Beyond Belief on their first joint advocacy campaign, which will call on the FDA to lift the blood donation ban for men who have sex with men, MSM, and women who have sex with MSM. The campaign launched in time for the week of action, I believe. Is that correct, Emily? Yes. Yeah. So next. <laughs> oh, image came up separate. But. Um, so our social justice uh, programs have continued. I, we have four alliances right now, which you can see at the bottom, our Black Humanist Alliance, Feminist Humanist Alliance, LGBTQ Humanist Alliance, and Latinx Humanist Alliance. And each of those has its own council, uh, social media accounts, and particular projects that they're focusing on. So we want to highlight the Feminist Humanist Alliance current project. Um, they've been reaching out uh, to humanist directly affected by the current COVID crisis and uh, expanding on their grant program. So this current um, focus includes projects that um, on community responses to COVID and that's uh, bringing in a more creative artistic um, view to the work that they do. And the Apinani Humanist Legal Center is continuing to take in uh, their reports of uh, church state uh, separation violations. So if you see those continue to report them um, Their current work has included various options uh, to ensure constitutional rights are protected such as two recent demand letters. There is one uh, to in Arkansas about the unconstitutional establishment of a new day of prayer um, 
and a reminder kind of in connection to the week of prayer or to the week of action which is in response to the week of prayer um the uh, first thursday of may is usually the national day of prayer so this is why um we've always taken action and turned that into national day of reason but with the current response to covid creating new days of prayer we've been um super active to um raise concern about that uh, there's also a demand letter on unconstitutional school activities at, that happened at a local Baptist church um, by a school district. We're working on two federal lawsuits, and we also signed an amicus brief with the Center for Inquiry and American Atheists supporting the state of Pennsylvania in the Little Sisters of the Poor Saints Peter and Paul Holm petitioner versus Pennsylvania um, case, and this had to do with um, reproductive justice and um, providing correct information uh, to women in need. Uh, there's more information about their work on the humanistlegalcenter.org. So in these uncertain times, it is important to remember that you're not alone, even when you're physically isolated. So in the May and June 2020 issue of the American Humanist Association, Humanist Magazine, it examines how we can get through the current crisis by centering on our humanist values. Leading intellectuals, four who contributed cha um, chapters to the most recent book, How to Live a Good Life, a guide to choosing your own personal philosophy, edited by Massimo Pigliucci, Sky Cleary, and Daniel A. Kaufman, apply sto stoicism, ethical culture, moralist humanism, Epicureanism, secular humanism to life and death during the COVID-19. The issue also features on the act and practice of reading, asking, among other things. Is, a, is a reading a good in itself or does it matter what you're reading? Contributors include Massimo Pigliucci, Ann Clayson, Anthony B. Penn, Haram Crispo, and John R. Shook. Um, as Emily mentioned, we do have other publications um, that are guided by our deputy director and editor-in-chief, Jennifer Barty. Um, we have a monthly, not just the monthly Humanist Magazine, but the daily online, thehumanist.com. And we also put, as Emily mentioned, the Free Mind is a quarterly newsletter that keeps members up to date on what we're doing and what you're doing. Um, so some of the highlights over the 2020 year so far is in January, the most popular articles during the month were Some Justice Prevails After Jag Queen Story Hour. That was by Samantha McGuire. Um, Betsy, Leave Them Kids Alone by Sam Gerard. And What Would a Humanist Do? Filling in the Blanks on a Fiance's Troubling Request by the AHA staff members. In February, we had Let's Say It's Time to End the National Prayer Breakfast by Becky Garrison, The Life and Times of Butterfly McQueen by Jennifer Barty and, Donna, um, and Donald, Betsy, and Mike, Head Cheerleaders for Private, Private School Vouchers by Sarah Henry. And then just last month, um, we had an article that was really popular in God in Anthony, um, I cannot say his name, Futi? F-A-U-C-I, Who is Pence COVID-19 Guy by Sam Gerard and the Profound Damage of Trump's Cure for COVID-19 by Al Rodbell. Um, so the ideas from this current magazine, Isolated But Not Alone, really got Emily and I thinking in the education department what more we could do to respond to the COVID-19 um, pandemic. So what came out of that was we developed a COVID-19 webinar series to highlight how humanists are um, hang, or handling and helping each other during uh, this pandemic. So part one happened on April 16th and has been recorded and added to the education website. It had uh, various representatives from different humanist organizations talking about how to connect with humanist community. Um, and even some of those ideas that came out of there, Chris and I have brought back to the AHA um, as ideas that, that we can do for programming. 
Um, part two is gonna take place this Tuesday, April 28th on how to engage in mutual aid. They'll have some representatives from the Foundation Beyond Belief to talk about their programs as well as the Secular Week of Action, which they are leading. Um, Danielle Muscato will talk about her work in um, local mutual aid. And uh, we're working on a couple other individuals as guest speakers to talk about their work and encourage um, us on what advice and tips we can use um, in our local areas and in our groups. And then part three will be on Thursday, May 14th on how to live a good life. As Kristen mentioned, we are taking some contributors to the book and the magazine and, um, and then some other humanist philosophy um, focused people to kind of share on the ethical dilemmas that have developed or worsened um, during the COVID-19 pandemic that we want to explore as humanists and uh, see how we can um, you know, provide some solutions and support. So uh, as mentioned, these are all gonna be recorded and put onto the education website, AmericanHumanistCenterForEducation.org. And uh, this is just one of the many things that we do. So <laughs> I'm gonna try to find a lot of different visuals to show. So I can talk a little bit about some of the things we do. Our Humanist Studies program is the foundation of the Center for Education. It was previously the Humanist Institute. It's a graduate level certificate program that now has four essential courses. Course one explores the ontological questions from a humanist perspective in historical and contemporary topics. Course two helps one to acquire solid grounding and critical thinking knowledge, truth, and humanist epistemologies. And course three aids students in analyzing and building a personal and articulate humanist exology from fundamental existential questions. And then there's a capstone course. This particular program has um, recently partnered with a like-minded institution, Meadville Lombard, Theological Seminary to offer students a master's in arts and leadership with a concentration in humanism. This is the first master's that focuses on humanism in the United States. Um, this program really is for people, well, for chapter leaders, for people really involved who want to be in leadership within the movement. Um, we have people from ethical culture, UU humanists. Right now we have a lot of students who are focused on humanist chaplaincy, lay leader and community leadership. Um, so those courses registration opens in August. Um, and if you want more information, you certainly can email us about that. Also in the education center, we have online courses. We have something, some 27 online courses along with four recorded open lecture series. Topic range from basic humanism and activism, psychology, law and policy, to parenting, religious humanism, race, women of color beyond faith, hip hop, the right to die, and trainings for celebrants on officiating life celebrations. Our open lecture series is focused on topics of critical concern to humanist, first being the future of humanism, then we moved on to focus on social justice, civic engagement of the yet nuns, and last year we did one on climate injustice. Um, and the last thing I will mention, you brought up the book on tyranny that you're reading. That was one book that was required as a part of our masterclass series, which mimics the topics of our open lecture series and providing more in-depth study of critical contemporary issues for established humanist leaders. Um, the first one we did was anti-blackness and humanism. The second we did on white nationalism. And this past February, we did one on intersectionality, humanism, identity politics, justice work, and the proliferation of social dis differences. These are all taught by higher level academics. The first one was taught by a uh, Princeton educated professor who now works in the religious studies department at McAllister. The second was the provost and um, senior fellow of Institute for Humanist Studies, and her name is Sharon, Dr. Sharon Welsh. She is also on our board of directors. 
And la the last one was taught by two professors from Lehigh University, Monica R. Miller, who serves on our board of directors, and her husband, Christopher Driscoll. Um, I can't say more about the Humanist Society, but I think I'll say it after you talk about your projects. Sure. Um, and uh, one thing to add, um, so Monica R. Miller and Chris Driscoll have also written a couple of the courses that we have online, so you can access those. Um, so I work especially with the groups, our um, chapters and affiliates. So I've been in communication with Jefferson Humanist before on checking in on your group and making sure you know about the resources available to you. Some of those resources include the Humanist Action Kit, which we used to call the Month in a Box. It's basically monthly recommendations on holidays and events and activities that your group can incorporate. Um, we also have, um, for the local DC chapter here, um, we have a monthly speaker series, and we've started to move that speaker series into an online format due to our current situation. Um, so we, and finding new ideas for other, for different webinar opportunities along with the COVID series we mentioned. So um, whenever we have a great speaker to share or a video to share, I usually pass that on to our groups and let them know about individuals who may be able to come talk to them or may be willing to do an online program like this one. Um, another place that has some great activity ideas is the Here for Climate website. And that was a uh, climate change initiative that started April 2019. So we're celebrating its first year. Uh, it is um, all about getting humanists together in action. Um, we have various activities and toolkits on that website. And it's also a place where we have um, some events and success stories. So I encourage all of our groups to let us know about the work you're doing um, in climate change and the successes that you have. Uh, that pre climate change was going to originally be the focus of Week of Action and then COVID hit. So now they've kind of changed it to be a passionate, uh, a compassionate response to COVID-19, um, but we also would love to continue to, um, you know, have people connect with nature and know and realize the um, the similarities between how we can react to the pandemic and how we can continue to react to the ongoing threat of climate change. Um, one thing not up here, but it's very important to us, is our Humanism for All program, which is our prison project. I provide the educational materials that we share widely to um, incarcerated people who identify as non-religious or humanist, so they have the same access. They can also form um, humanist groups at their facility that we help out and um, support. Sometimes we need to provide some legal support um, to them if their facility is limiting their rights. Um, we also have a pen pal program that everyone is welcome to join to um, correspond with the incarcerated humanists and um, and we give them a um, reduced fee for membership. Um, and I'll, before I hand it back to Kristen, the, the current open lecture series that we're working on for 2020 that is still on since it's in October, um, will be in St. Louis and focus on intersectional feminism. So I'm currently um, coordinating with some speakers to, and also preparing for some backup plans, but we look forward to recording that um, and sharing that. Yeah, Emily's got a great lineup with that, so I'm really, really excited. She's been working hard. Um, the, the last thing that's under the education department is we do provide administrative support for the Humanist Society, which if probably most people are familiar, it, the Humanist Society is the endorsing body for celebrants and chaplains. Right now we have about 400 endorsed celebrants and chaplains performing life celebrations and supporting and caring for our community and the larger community. Um, we do help the Humanist Society with their quarterly web uh, teleconferences. And the last one they had was COVID-19 and wedding ceremonies. There's a lot of, you know, how, how can people get married? It's not legal by proxy. So people are, you know, concerned about helping people continue to find joy in life. Um, the next one 
normally they they'll do it like i said quarterly but they're because of covid they're going to do one next month on end of life preparation and all the issues that are coming up in regards to that people dying without being able to uh, say goodbye to their loved ones or be by their side so i'm looking forward to that um do you want to go on to the ten commitments and i can talk a little bit about that yeah, um, just to answer a couple of the questions that came up that related to this slide, um, the there the online courses have both free and a one time fee um, availability. I'm um, sorry, a one time fee payment, um, but and then you get a, the courses available to you um, the whole time. Um, there is a payment um, for the Humanist Studies program, which is explained on the website, and we're happy to answer questions offline um because uh, there are also scholarship opportunities um and the other um matthew asked are the classes recorded none of the human studies program or master classes are recorded we do encourage students to um write articles about them so that and um you kind of see where we can expand or share the information from it um but it's those are um, in person because that's a very different experience to have. They, they are college level graduate seminar courses. So um, there isn't necessarily a lecture format. This It's a, a low residency program where the students are provided syllabuses and um, readings ahead of time. They meet with the professor um, once a month, uh, they might have assignments beforehand, and then they have an intensive five day in person class, and then they have a wrap up. So it, it really is a college course that students can get credit for. Um, so we don't, yeah, we don't tape those, but everything else we've been trying to record um, so that people can have access, like our open lecture series or our online classes or you know this today so we're doing our best to get as much as we can online but like as emily said the human studies program is a unique experience um because it is sort of a university college level course with credit um i will are there more questions right now um, a couple more we can come back to those are just so this is the thing that Emily and I are most proud of. I would say, well, I, I'm most proud of this and I'm proud of the work that she and I have put in. Um, the 10 Commitments was an idea of Prapal Kochar, who is a friend of the AHA. Um, he was, basically it came out of the idea that he was tired of the age debating what is humanism and wished to make humanism more actionary. What do humanists stand for? What do humanists do? So he came up with the Ten Commandments and yes, it was based on the idea of the Ten Commandments, but um, not to be associated with. Um, he wanted humanist values to be more accessible and a practical way to express our humanism in our daily lives. So we in the Education Center took on these 10 commitments. They had been sort of sitting dormant and we took six months and really thought about them and rewrote all the descriptions. And out of that initial, during that same time, I had a scout master from florida approached me about doing a now in the scout program they call it the religious emblems program and the unitarian universalist and major, a lot of other religions allow scouts to go through a workbook and accomplish tasks that would say i'm a good christian or i'm a dedicated jewish scout or i'm a muslim scout and they get this religious emblems badge well we decided to help him with this effort and create a humanist religious emblems badge and we put together with his help a book for the scouts now shortly after we launched this everyone may know that the scouts kind of fell into disarray and t over 12 I think it was 12,000 accusations of sexual misconduct 
and they are now in bankruptcy and mired in lawsuits. Um, so we decided we're not going to continue on that avenue. And um, and I'll, I'll let Emily say we then took the workbook and Emily and you can talk about your piece in this. Sure. So uh, yeah, I reworked it so that it could be used by any child, um, whether or not they were connected to a scout program or part of a um, humanist community or religious community um, and basically uh, defined each of the commitments and added some activities that they could do. And it was um, not only for the child's development, but there's also an opportunity for them to work with an adult. So we kind of recommended that you still have a mentor the way that the scouts have counselors, um, whether it's a parent or a friend, maybe even just an older student, um, like a teenager, uh, that can kind of help with the bigger words and answer the questions and um, expand off of the workbook. So once um, we got a request from Camp Quest um, saying, you know, we really want to help not only our uh, Camp Quest families during these times, but the wider movement um, of humanist families where they've got, you know, kids at home and they're not quite sure what to do to keep them entertained and learning and maybe off their screens playing games. Uh, so we pushed out this workbook to share with them. So they're, sh they're sharing it with their families. Um, I've shared the 10 commitments with the American Ethical Union and have since um, helped incorporate it into some national education classes and seen individual societies start to incorporate it into their lesson plans, kind of like a guide, um, not necessarily like a, um, a strict here's how to accomplish altruism idea, but just here's ways that we can um, practice altruism. And, um, and we also had developed these posters that have been selling um, for several months and um, been sharing with local groups who wanted to kind of discuss the commitments in their meetings, uh, some resources that they can use. Yeah, and I'll add that Camp Quest, um, if a kid gets through the workbook, um, they're going to give them a badge and a Camp Quest backpack that they can put their badge proudly on their backpack. Um, I'll also mention that this workbook got picked up by the Uganda Humanist Trust Schools, and I've been working with the chair of those schools to provide the Ten Commitments as a foundation for their kids in um, elementary, middle school, and they're also the higher ed, I believe, too. And they're starting to put activities online for their teachers to use the Ten Commitments to teach kids about environmentalism, critical thinking. We adapted it specifically. We realized that when we looked at that book, what the activities were very uh, Western European, American, um, centric and so I've been working with the chair to make the activities more um, geared towards what kids would experience in Uganda so I'm really excited about that project but for us the Ten Commitments is not just a wonderful way for children to carry out their humanist values and for teachers to teach humanist values but they're an excellent guide to us living our values for everyone, not just during this pandemic, but every day. Um, so we came up with some ideas that groups can use the foundation of the Ten Commitments um, to really work your values, your humanist values during this time. And some of them for altruism, empathy, and humility, we kind of combined them. Um, some of our ideas is to provide emotional support. Listen and share um, how you're coping with your stress and grief. Everybody copes with it differently. Um, cook together, share recipe and tips. This was one of the, as Emily mentioned, the ideas that came out of our COVID webinar that um, the one of the graduates of our humanist studies program is the head of spiritual life at the University of California? Southern California. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And so she has been, she realized that a lot of the student body and community that she was, humanist community she was working with, where they they'd get together and cook. So they tried to figure out how are we gonna get together and cook? So Vanessa has been putting out recipes um, with items that students can easily get and they've been cooking together and she shared with us that the outcomes are very interesting, like kind of fun. <laughs> outcomes are different um, as everybody's been experiencing virtual tea time coffee hour happy hour are great times to reach out to people be empathetic um, book clubs you guys are doing those viewing parties discuss what you're reading and watching and I heard at the beginning you guys are already doing those um, the other thing you can do during this time is ask your neighbors friends and family if they need supplies or services um, you can always drop off a bag of groceries without touching anyone um, and help them out. Yeah, and I want to add, you know, um, I did start to stress out when I couldn't find toilet paper in any of my local restaurants and stores. Um, and honestly, just like venting about that got some of the people I know to be like, well, wait, did you check out this link? And have you heard about this place? And do you need me to ship it over to you? So sometimes I think that the that first part, the providing emotional support and just listening may end up also resulting in some ways that we can figure out next steps to supporting each other. Um, so then we also were looking at combining environmentalism and critical thinking. And the critical thinking part often kind of encompasses the scientific method and the logic reason that we uh, think of often connected to humanism. So um, if you're able to walk around safely in your area, you can you know, put on some gloves and pick up trash. Um, make sure that you continue thinking about how you can recycle and reuse materials. Um, if you are able to grow your own vegetables in your backyard or maybe just you know, as a plant. Um, I've, also, I've been hearing people talk about how much they realize the importance of having um, just greenery nearby as kind of an uplifting, Thing for them. Um, and if you do you still have your uh, farmers markets open, definitely you know, support the local um, farmers. And um, if you are, we encourage people to walk or bike to their stores when they go out so we can drive less. As you've probably seen, there's been um, a big drop in the um, carbon emissions lately. And we're hoping that people can kind of become more cognizant about how about their carbon footprint and see if they can find ways to not go back to their regular habits and we can continue to support uh, the planet around us. Um, and especially looking at promoting science research and education. And we, of course, promote that all year round, but um, we've seen in a lot of our current um, briefings and some social media rhetoric that people just don't believe the uh, the struggles that our medical professionals are dealing with and actually listening to the advice out there on how we can handle uh, this pandemic with certain practices um, and trying to stay healthy. Um, and then as I mentioned before, Here for Climate has more resources and ideas that we can expand on. Uh, we originally had like a lot more things for environmentalism, but to be fair, we're kind of like trying to go with a similar amount for each one. Uh, and there's, I, I know you, uh, you had mentioned about, uh, I think Nancy had mentioned about um, the hikes and, you know, some groups are still able to socially distance on some walks and bike rides together. Um, I know some people usually for a week of action do like highway cleanups and park cleanups. Uh, so check if there is still opportunities to do projects in your area. And if not, look forward to, you know, having them when we are able to go outside. I have to say that right now my husband is out building me another garden box so <laughs> so I can separate my tomatoes from my zucchini because my tomatoes were killing my zucchini. Mm. Uh, the box was not big enough so um, moving on to ethical development and responsibility. Some of the things you can do is remember to tip your delivery people and service workers. Um, 
when you're ordering takeout and trying to support your local businesses, it's really important to continue to tip people. Um, be considerate and patient with people still working. I have a friend in, who is a grocery store worker who is, uh, has a husband with diabetes and she's very concerned and people get really impatient with her when she's trying to distance herself and um, peach, you know, and she keeps saying, remember to be nice. Um, educate people on the concerns of ending stay at home orders too soon. As we all know, if we end it too soon, will end up making things worse. Prepare for your elections, educate on issues, learn of changes and deadlines, discuss neat steps needed for your group to safely gather. And I very much heard Nancy talk about you guys continuing to, you know, do virtual meetings up through June just to keep safe. Yeah, and um, on the election front, there are two voter mobilizations that AHA is supporting. One is the UU the vote, um, which we're referring to as humanize the vote because we're taking the kind of humanist angle on the resources that the UUA has put out there to share, uh, and also the secular America votes. Um, and that's going to be led this year by the Secular Student Alliance. And they're working on recommendations um, we're kind of editing the toolkit right now, but they are hoping to continue to do the voter registration drives that they had planned, but just kind of adjust them due to um, the pandemic. Uh, and then there's the peace and social justice, global awareness and service and participation uh, commitments. So we recommend uh, learn about how other countries are impacted by and handling COVID-19. Um, Continue to support your local businesses. If you're not able to physically go there, consider buying gift cards, doing takeout, or promoting them on social media. I've seen you know, some institutions that are struggling have been getting um, more publicity from their fans so that people um, are aware of you know, which ones are being hit harder than others. Um, please consider donating to a local food bank and uh, relief organizations. Donate to museums offering virtual tours and um, especially we want to emphasize standing up um, against discrimination both in person and online. As you've probably seen, uh, some people are taking um, COVID as an opportunity um, to or excuse to be able to attack Asian Americans um, for blaming them for the development of this virus and um, it is just discussing how many reports there have been about people getting attacked. Uh, and, and this unfortunately has also happened due to some of the political rhetoric and just misinformation going out there. And um, while we you know, certainly are not the people spreading it, we should also make sure that we're stopping the spread of uh, such behavior and rhetoric. So I, I want to thank you all for inviting us to talk more about the AHA. And um, those of you who are not members, please join. There's lots of benefits. You get a subscription to that wonderful Humanist magazine that I mentioned. Um, you get access to quarterly issues of the Free Mind, access to our network of 220 local groups, chapters across the country, and you get a copy of Creating Change Through Humanism, book written by Royce Beckhart. And um, our mailroom guy wanted to share with you that he's hard at work. He, he and one other, I think only three people are periodically going into the office. And that's our mailroom at the AHA. And he was hard at work processing um, new membership packets for um, new members and that's the big stack he was working on so he sent us that photo to share with you all um, and me, Emily any further words before we open it up to questions um, no nope. yeah I think we we're good um, so one pressing question that um, a couple of people asked was an update on the annual conference, the um, World Humanist Congress. We don't have one. Um, 
we are in a holding pattern waiting for Florida to make a decision. Um, we have a hotel contract we can't get out of and at risk of losing considerable funds. So we've been waiting patiently for um, some kind of word from Florida that if we cancel, then we can get out of our hotel contract without losing significant funds. Um, and we are, key, we are watching this on a daily basis. Um, we should be able, I think in the next couple of weeks, have some defini more definitive answers. Um, that's all I know at this time. Yeah. Um, so we do have um, a current message on the World Humanist Congress website, basically explaining that we will update people as soon as we are able to. And um, and we and we haven't had plans yet to move it online like we did last year. We did for some of you that may have participated. We did a teleconference from four different locations. I don't know if we end up canceling the in-person conference, if we'll move it online. That has not been discussed amongst the staff yet. Mm -hmm. um, so another question was, um, can you share some of the hints from the webinars about connecting, serving the community, or living a good life? Um, well, definitely, it's, we recommend watching them, but I can say um, to expand on some of the activities that Chris and I mentioned, um, I think some of the most interesting things that came out of that first one about community was um, how groups are checking in on their members, doing like calls and emails to see what uh, support and services are needed or what people are able to provide others. Um, there is, um, it's definitely some testing and learning going on with Zoom as your group is doing. We're, uh, I've seen groups use like the breakout rooms on Zoom um, and try um, different visuals, kind of doing both presentations as well as more social gatherings. Um, and as we talked about with like the... the was a really amusing was Sunday Assembly California. He mm -hmm. was doing a confessional so yeah. he a humanist confessional so people could send in their confessions and then he was reading them online to stay connected to his group i liked um the tea with the dean come and meet me for tea um, other people have been having grief groups um, if you've lost somebody from COVID, um, small, supportive, like four to five people, grief groups um, to reach out to people who are struggling with loss at this time when you can't have a hug. Um, other ideas that you remember? Um, there's an interesting use of like music and dancing and um, welcoming members to provide videos and that someone could kind of put together in a compilation. Um, I would recommend that as much as you do want to focus on providing your members with programming, don't forget to also publicize your group to the, the wider movement and general audience because people are very much looking for ways to connect and looking for people that you know, are going to care about the science and care about the relationship. So I think that we will see um, higher interest in individuals looking for groups like ours. And there's also an increase in people being available on social media. So, you know, make sure you keep promoting on social media what you're up to. I do remember that Camp Quest had kind of a fun, they were going to do virtual campfires and mm -hmm. with their kids and they were going to do a camp out so kids could put tents up in their basements or in their backyards and and they were going to virtually connect which was kind of fun for the kids so um that one that one i'm i remember from the camp quest meeting other questions um yeah so i see there's okay so keep typing them into the chat so i'm checking again um there's a question with the 10 Commitments workbook um, about what uh, age range 
that's uh, eight middle school. I would say it's about middle school. Um, wouldn't you say, um? Um, yeah, maybe like, maybe a little bit with fourth and fifth graders. I guess it very much depends on if the, on how much assistance the adult is providing. Yeah, they, um, they elementary to middle school. Mm -hmm. Some of the, we've been discussing uh, different additions. So we have been talking about, could we make the workbook for smaller kids um, and for older folks? older children, high schoolers. Yeah, and so we have the workbook available as a PDF right now um, on the Center for Education website, where we also have the link to purchase the posters, and we'll put uh, other versions and other materials available there. We also, um, as Kristen mentioned, developed badges for people that, uh, for children that finish the whole workbook. So we'll make um, those available, and, as, and anything else we make, like preparing some stickers and possibly some other translations of the workbook. We'll make sure to all include on that page that has uh, the yeah, time commitment. So. We'll be translating it into different languages soon. Mm -hmm. uh, but the badges are ready and available. They came into the office, I'm told. So if a kid wants to earn a badge, they're, they're pretty cool. They're iron-on badges and they're the little happy human. They're, they're really well designed. They're pretty cool. Um, let's see, there's also, um, so Foundation Beyond Belief, yes, is, um, a, like an adjunct organization that we work with, um, and they are taking the lead with the Secular Week of Action, which is May 1st through 10th, um, and they'll, um, and they're going to be part of the second part of the COVID webinar series. Um, they also are doing a virtual 5K that um, raises monies for uh, groups in need. I think they're specifically gonna focus on uh, the Black Skeptics of LA and uh, a couple others. Um, so I'll make sure to, sh to share with uh, your organizers the, the link for that. Um, Nancy wrote that she can see some of the UU religious education programs using the 10 Commitments. And definitely we are looking to, to sharing with some of the religious humanist groups and um, and also parents in general. We're always getting asked by parents for curriculum. I, I also want to mention that um, I, there's a new chapter that developed in downtown Chicago and I was talking to the leader of that um, for a whole nother reason but he mentioned that he uses the Ten Commitments as a way to explain what humanism to new members that walk in the door who are interested but don't always you know understand the definition of tell me what humanism means and he says it's been a really really effective way for new members to go oh i get that and really resonate to that um, and that it's been a helpful tool um, again we have posters you can either download and print the posters from our website or you can they're not very expensive you can order them from our office and we can send them out yes we have a card um we have postcards that we can that we were going to have available at our world humanist congress but we could send some groups postcards it's a little difficult at this time with um but we can ask our mailroom guy once he gets through membership packets to run upstairs and get some postcards and we could send you some if you'd like yeah and i think we um we were i'll check to make sure that the order went in but we were planning to order a big batch so that we can include them as an option in the um tabling request form that groups are, have access to and that um that form is where you can request you know specific tabling materials to send out um Okay, yes, <laughs> I, I see Nancy, no rush, but definitely, yeah, it, it's definitely a great thing to have. We're happy to share them and we look forward to, you know, however you'd like to use them. Um, there is one question uh, that I didn't touch on. Um, Nancy had also asked, uh, 
if you had to pick one topic we should write to our legislators about, what would it be? And I think that's a little bit of a personal preference. Um, we as AHA um, are not um, saying, you know, only one thing matters. Um, certainly we encourage your group to discuss issues, like if there's something very important to like locally, uh, but I'd say some of the topics to definitely be aware of would be um, climate justice, um, social justice, um, separation of church and state. Mm -hmm. Kristen, do you want to add on any of those? Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. Um, one of the things we're talking about among staff is while climate has been positively impacted by COVID, people haven't really changed their ways and the legislator hasn't changed their ways. So um, it's a good time to say, hey, you know, with climate injustice that we need to keep focused on that and not to let up the pressure and the um, human rights at this time, people having equal access um, and civil rights where black communities are being hit very hard by COVID. And as Emily mentioned, Asian communities are being blamed. Um, so it's a good, you know, keep writing to your legislators to make sure, and especially, you know, they're finding an avenue now to, um, like in education, you know, schools are closed, so we're going to get in there. Um, so, um, and the blasphemy laws, we're continuing to go after that. So if you support that action, certainly write letters. But um, again, she, as Emily mentioned, if you have issues in your own area, be sure as a group to get together and decide, you know, um, how to take action. Great. Well, thank you all for your questions. Thank you. Do we want to turn it back to Nancy for last minute? Kristen yes. and Emily, very much for jumping in at the last minute. Um, we only asked them about 10 days ago if they would do this, and they said yes. So we really, really appreciate their sharing their information. Um, I just want to close by saying that we hope to do this again in, um, in May. It will be on um, May. 24th, same time, 4 p.m. At the moment, um, it's a little up in the air whether we'll be in person or online, but we will definitely have it one way or the other. Our speaker is going to be Maeve Conrad. She's the director of KGNU radio station, which is the public broadcasting sta uh, station in Boulder, Colorado. And her topic is going to be Reporting facts in a fake news world. Um, she's already agreed to go ahead, so we're pretty sure we're going to be able to have the program one way or another. And then I'll just end by saying, um, buy local. I really agree with what um, Chris and Emily said. Support the local businesses. You might go out of business if you don't. So as you buy, think about who needs it the most. And finally, just stay home and stay healthy. Thank you so much for participating today. And thank you, Emily and Kristen, again.